And we climbed because it's fun. And mainly, it was fun. Every now and then, it went wildly wrong. And then it wasn't. Why do we climb? What drives people to hurl themselves against nature's most fearsome monuments? What draws them to risk life and limb and frigid digit? Why do we long to exist in places our bodies weren't made for? And what, exactly, is it all in pursuit of? Ego. Purpose? Achievement? Death's constant companionship to such a pastime insists something more urgent still. There must be a need. A defect, perhaps. A madness, most definitely. But a need, nevertheless, to ascend. Those souls, drawn ever upwards, aren't just conquering a mountain, they are conquering a part of themselves, sating a thirst unquenchable by anything but the summit. To be a climber, you need that thirst. To be told of Annapurna's 29% fatality rate and say, okay. To reckon with the death zone of Everest and say, sign me up. To find yourself on the face of an eight-thousander and realise a carabiner is all that stands in the way of you becoming a grim statistic. These are the kinds of things people wouldn't reckon with unless their lives depended on it. And so it only makes sense that, for those who choose mountains, their lives must depend on it. J'ignore ce que c'est. Mais j'ai cessé de me poser la question quand j'ai compris que c'était indispensable. To those broken few, a life without climbing is no life at all. Is what I don't understand. One little mistake, one little slip, and you fall and die. Yeah, I mean, I, you seem to understand it well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if they must risk it to live it, so be it. It's a vicious and at times violent circle, and for those stricken, it's all that matters. So why do we climb? A New York Times journalist asked the question, why climb Everest? Mallory gave his legendary reply. Torn between the skyscrapers of Tokyo and the skyscrapers of Nepal, the summit of the gods is a split picture. The hubbub of a metropolis stands in stark contrast to the haunting quiet of mountain ranges around the world. And our lead, climber and photojournalist Makoto Fukumachi, is obsessed not only with the ascent, but why we ascend. Set in 1994, Fukumachi is attempting to uncover the truth about real-life mountaineer George Mallory. Mallory is the source of much debate in the climbing world. He was primed to be the first person to ever conquer Everest, yet never made it back to base camp. It took 75 years for his body to be found on the side of the mountain, and the mystery of whether he died before or after having reached the summit remains unsolved to this day. I noticed far away on a snow slope leading up to what seemed to me to be the last step but one from the base of the final pyramid, a tiny object moving and approaching the rock step. A second object followed, and then the first climb to the top. As I stood intently watching this dramatic appearance, the scene became enveloped in cloud once more. 
It was, of course, none other than Mallory and Irvin. This is what Fukumachi finds himself fixated on, and it may just take climbing the mountain himself to get an answer. The picture's standout moments are, of course, those ascents. Portrayed as careful, considered, and utterly terrifying all at once. In excruciating detail, we see bolts screwed, carabiners clipped, and ropes unwound with all the delicate tension, you would hope, from anything happening above thousand-foot falls. We're encouraged to focus on the minute expressions forming on a resolute face, the panicked breathing of a climber pushing their physical and mental limits, and even the long and uneventful slogs through snow between cliffsides. For such a short film, Summit of the Gods assures us it has all the time in the world to appreciate the art of the climb, ratcheting a quiet tension over a runtime that seems to expand under such duress. When that tension is punctured, spent all at once on a single, sharp mistake, there won't be many viewers who don't gasp or scream with the characters on screen. It's hard to call these cuts leisurely, considering the subject matter, but their pacing is just that. In long stretches of absolute silence, Summit trusts its audience to appreciate both its outstanding beauty and unique tempo. In its beauty, we find a thousand works of art, each a resting freeze frame easy to mistake for a photograph. In its tempo, however, we find an even more realistic truth, selling climbing not as an ever-tense series of increasingly complicated problems, but as a test of endurance, a rewarding marathon punctuated by spikes of difficulty and peace. In that truth, there is purpose. Endless tension is nothing. No, tension only exists in contrast to tranquility. This masterful balance is where Summit of the Gods towers over its peers, and it's a balance that defined the works of mangaka Jiro Taniguchi. Jiro Taniguchi was an artist best known for his sedate storytelling. Over a 35-year career, it was the quiet, contemplative works that defined him, despite the occasional hard-boiled comic full of bloody brawls. But, even in his fiercer outings, Taniguchi never forgot the importance of stillness. Summit of the Gods is Taniguchi's most famous outlier to that more leisurely library. A manga about scaling the world's tallest mountains would be a similarly monumental achievement for this legendary artist, who even hiked to Kathmandu to prepare for it. And it sits in stark contrast to the quiet jaunts around idyllic Japanese neighbourhoods that he would become best known for. Taniguchi may have spent a lifetime capturing Japan in this way, but his work truly thrived in France. He forged a legacy there that would, for much of his life, elude him at home. He was seen by French readers, illustrators and publishers as a god. Through his vast oeuvre, working with a variety of collaborators, Taniguchi straddled comics and manga in a unique way. His elegant line art captured something deeply human with such simplicity, and in that simplicity, he told profoundly contemplative stories. A person walks through their neighbourhood and, for the first time, truly sees it. A lonely salaryman, always on the road for work, tries local eateries with ardent fervour. A man is transported back to his youth to live it again with the experience of his years. These middle-class, often middle-aged heroes, 
lost in Japan and finding themselves all at once, speak a universal language about the human experience. Whilst certain titles, such as The Solitary Gourmet, found wild domestic success, spawning a long-running and beloved TV show, oh his more meditative tales truly flourished in Western Europe. Inspired as he was by the Franco-Belgian comic scene, it's fitting that his works were in turn adapted by Franco-Belgian cinema, the likes of Cartier Lointain and Un Ciel Hadier, signifying a homecoming of sorts for his works, whilst a knighthood by the French government made it official. Taniguchi was an adopted artiste. So, when it came time to adapt Taniguchi's mountain climbing masterpiece, it made sense that it was France who decided to tackle that monstrosity. In the same way that Taniguchi had married French and Japanese styles in his artwork, Le Sommi des Dieux pulled off a similar trick. Here were Japanese leads, living Japanese lives, deep in the heart of Tokyo, mumbling in French between mouthfuls of ramen. Summit doesn't move like anime. It certainly doesn't sound like anime. And yet, it perfectly captures Taniguchi's stark vision. In its ascent, you may just spot another Japanese road, however vertical, for our middle-aged heroes to find themselves on. As Fukumachi tries to piece together the life of Mallory, he in turn must piece together the life of the only man who might help solve that mystery, a world-renowned climber called Habu Joji. Fukumachi, much like the film itself, has a keen eye for evolution, and through him we see Joji go from a young boy in love with both the climb and his own climbing prowess, to an older man whose love has been replaced by a cold respect. With its disorganised timeline, the picture could have been a messy affair, but even without context, you would be able to place these flashbacks simply by the state of Joji's ego. Moi, je la couperai. Huh? Ça sert à rien de mourir tous les deux. Over 90 minutes, it's tempered and tested, and it's here, in subdued moments of reflection and humility, that Taniguchi's introspective soul, present in so much of his work, steps confidently onto the screen. And there is also a progression um, on the, the dialogue that mm -hmm. turns to silence. And at the end, at the second part, this is the time where the mountain can speak. The film conveys much in such stretches of silence, not least the distance in skill between our disheveled deuteragonists. Whilst more typical fare might be inclined to showcase Joji's skill with a strength-summoning scream as he reaches for the next handhold, we are instead, much like Fukumachi, simply left in his quiet wake. The camera turns a corner, just to see Joji already disappearing around the next. Fukumachi steals himself for a sheer wall as Joji dips over its peak. Summit says a lot, whilst saying very little. When it speaks, we're made to understand that nothing presented here is solely of the page. Every argument about moral relativism on a mountain, or discussing when inspirational tenacity becomes dangerous bullheadedness, feels terrifyingly genuine the exact discussions men and women like this would have over a couple of beers. Even more genuine still are the loved ones left behind in the wake of tragedy, who even in grief understand that to stop the deceased from climbing would have simply been a different sort of death. It was so dangerous, but I knew it was going to be life-changing for him. I worry for him, of course. 
that at least God granted me the grace to understand this about my son, to not stand in the way of his passion for the mountains. Summit of the Gods bottles a particularly bitter draught that the layman will have a hard time swallowing, resulting in the kind of stupefied wonder that leads naive YouTube essayists to make entire videos asking, why do we climb? As someone whose life will never likely depend on knowing how to tie a prussic knot, I can ask these questions in comfortable disbelief and try to put it in redundant black and white terms. What is it that lies at the summit that makes it all worthwhile? But for those who climb, who can't not climb, it isn't so straightforward. To reckon with Everest, known as the world's largest open-air graveyard, you've got to reckon with its hundreds of corpses. When snow cover is light on popular routes, you'll have to step over their outstretched, exposed limbs just to reach the peak. There are precious few long-time climbers who haven't got a story of a loved one lost. Maybe half of the leading solo climbers of all times died in the mountains. No. Few climb without understanding, at a very raw level, the possibility of what lies ahead. But as much as the summit of the gods entertains this ghoulish truth, it also speaks to the majesty of the mountain. The freedom found halfway up its face, the joys of eating lunch above the tree line, or the life-saving warmth of a bivouac above the clouds. None of those explain the why, and yet, as Summit pulls its focus back to take in the whole mountain, a picture starts to form. Like Taniguchi's simple line art that belied a deep well of understanding for the human spirit, Summit understands something ineffable about mountain climbing. Mountaineer Greg Child once said that somewhere between the bottom of the climb and the summit is the answer to the mystery of why we climb. That answer also resides somewhere between the beginning and the end of Summit of the Gods. In its vast stretches of silence, it speaks in ways I've always struggled to comprehend in ways that my friends who climb have always failed to put into words. The eternally chapped lips of its characters don't offer an answer, but an answer exists nevertheless, in every frigid frame and jaw-dropping vista. It's said you never climb the same mountain twice, and true to that, Summit of the Gods shifts between viewings, its revelation of why, changing with every subsequent ascent. As always, thanks for watching. The Summit of the Gods is a spectacular treatise on the human spirit. And whilst I wanted to echo that exploration here today, I also wanted to celebrate the life and library of Jiro Taniguchi. If you haven't already, please seek out his works. I assure you that in doing so, your spirit will be sated and emboldened all at once. As a long-time and thoroughly vicarious enjoyer of climbing and mountaineering, I'm a big fan of the films and documentaries I pulled from today and I recommend each and every one of them if you're looking for truly stomach-turning cinema. As always, you can subscribe to Beyond Ghibli for more recommendations just like these. If, instead, you wish me to challenge an 8000er, hit the like button and I'll trade my computer for carabiners and climbing tools. <laughs>